Oh, welcome back. If you're just joining us, you are watching um, Business AM right here on Metropole TV. My name is Nina Shaban. I am standing in for my colleague, Simba Elijah Charles Kiyage. We had an interesting conversation ongoing before we went on a break. Um, with me in studio virtually is John Moniki, financial consultant, Randall, uh, Tommy Randall, who's a policy analyst, uh, Alex Ndegwa, who's a lawyer, Erastus Mulana, Munala, sorry, who's an economic analyst. Uh, lady and gentlemen, if you do not mind, we are going to um, continue and jump right onto our next topic. According to the Accenture Africa IGDP forecast, the digital economy is expected to add about 1.4 trillion shillings or about 9.24% of the GDP to Kenya's economy by 2025. Now this is because it is one of the fastest growing sectors in the country. According to the report, the online industry will contribute 810 billion shillings to Kenya's GDP this year alone. And Kenya leads um, other African countries in terms of digital economies, contribution to the GDP at 7.7%, followed by Morocco and South Africa at 6.82% and 6.51% respectively. Some of the major businesses driving the online industry in Kenya are e-commerce firms such as Copia and Jumia, fintech products like M-Pesa and Mshwari, health tech platforms like Daktari Africa, and food delivery startups. Now, um, Rondel, looking at the industry's performance, it is indeed performed well. It has indeed performed well, and especially during this particular pandemic. Now, that's um, one of the fastest growing sectors in the country. What's your take on this? I uh, think there's a lot of opportunity in the fintech sector. Uh, and especially at the time when we had the 7 p.m. lockdown, a lot of people depended on Glovo to get you food because they could deliver food up to much later. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the average person who leaves work at 5 o'clock, maybe they get home at 6.30, they don't want to cook. For those who could afford it, they uh, would have to use these apps to order food. And uh, that uh, made a lot that created a lot of opportunities and a bunch of other restaurants started doing the same thing which grew that uh, sector of the economy also look at sports betting <laughs> as much as people don't like others betting that was part of fintech technology that we've uh, kind of innovated and uh, grew the economy based on that because they raise a lot of revenue without putting in a lot of capital to have like a, a shop mm -hmm. so uh, i would encourage fintech to grow sky's the limit the sky is the limit, isn't it? Alex? Um, of course, I agree with Randall. And I think everyone is you know, sort of in consensus that we've seen most of these um, technology companies really growing fast, amassing a huge consumer base. But I just really like to bring um, a different perspective from, I think, what the CEO of Netflix said. That in as much as you know, they are seeing subscribers increase because of the lockdown, you know, you have to see through the numbers. And seeing through the numbers is the fact that the consumers that will have been acquired next year have just been acquired now. Mm -hmm. So it's basically an accelerated client acquisition, you know, client acquisition numbers. And post pandemic, you know, there might not be that huge uh, margin of growth um, or headroom of growth for these technology companies. Mm -hmm. But for now, I think you know they are doing well and. You know, as the digital tax comes in next year, together with the VAT on digital services, we'll wait to see what the impact of that is going to be um, on the digital sector. But again, you know, the sky is the limit, as Tommy said, yeah. All right. So it's a wait and see when it comes to the taxes. Um, uh, Erastus, what is your take when it comes to... Um, uh, what is your take when it comes to the industry's performance? Um, I think it has performed generally well. And that is the uh, way to go. Um, getting our size of Kenya, we, we notice uh, large, large multinational tech companies grew significantly during the, this period. So, and the, since we are in, uh, in the era of technology, I think there is no 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 other way of us getting out of it. We have to to adapt with, with, the, with the technology. So we can leverage much from 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 the current trends. So I think. Uh, I, I think they, they, they continue to grow, especially in the e-commerce sector. All right. Joanne? Uh, for me, I think I can say, like everybody has said, that there has been a, a good trend in uh, e-commerce growth. For me, I would look at the number of jobs that have been created from uh, these platforms. 
that many people have uh, and many youths have gotten uh, work from these uh, creative ideas. So um, I'd look at job creation um, and of course uh, ease of services, uh, delivery of services that uh, you can get services at your doorstep uh, instead of moving out to get them. So um, looking at that, like Alex has said, um, there has of course been creation of customers for next year for this year. Uh, so I, I think there is, there, there is need to look at um, in terms of the space that has that will be left for next year. How else we can expand on that uh, particular platform for us to just fill in the gaps that have been created also. All right. Yeah. Now um, stay with me, Joanne. Kenya has a wealth uh, of tech talent, which includes over fifty-eight thousand professional developers. How best can developers make significant contributions to the internet economy through their innovative solutions? Um, okay. Looking at bit from this perspective, mm -hmm. that. Um, I think it's just to look at it as a perspective that uh, the sky is the limit in terms of um, where we can go with this kind of um, creation of wealth and development. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the, we are now a global, the world is a global village, so just looking at not only tapping the Kenyan market, but tapping the global market in as far as development is concerned. So I would look at uh, just being able to the different frontiers uh, in the coming uh, coming days. Okay. Now, um, Rastas, how best can developers make significant contributions to the internet economy uh, through their innovative solutions? Uh, there's a lot that they can do. Maybe they can uh, keep on developing new technologies and then adapt uh, your, adopt uh, flexible working, working practices. For example, working from home. You see, with the, with the current trend, it's much easier to to, to work from home rather than renting an office space because someone can just even work from their bedroom and produce a certain product. So, and the, for them to do that, we also need the, the, the government initiative. For example, the government should, should give more incentives, uh, such as uh, increased spending in education. So that will, will boost the, the developers and make the, the careers more appealing. So it can fool even more people to come and all right. Join the All right. Team. All right. Randall. Many of these uh, developers develop apps. A lot of these apps fail, but those that are successful and are able to be accessible through the Play Store or the Apple Store or any other platform tend to do well because they have some credibility behind them, no matter what product they're pushing. And also, uh, another thing is maybe Forex trading on a mobile app would be a very good idea because uh, you're not limited to trading within our borders. You can trade with anybody elsewhere, uh, throughout anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. All right, and finally, Alex, let me hear your take before we jump to the next question. Um, I think the government has a huge role to play you know, in this because in as much as we live, you know, we stay in Nairobi, we're exposed to Nairobi, and we see all these applications being used in Nairobi, that might not really reflect in, in what is happening um, in other areas of the country, which has the most, you know, the, you know, the, the, the large numbers of people. So I think in terms of critical infrastructure, the government needs to build more roads so that if we are, if we are going to get global to my grandmother in Nyandarwa, at least, you know, when she orders, when she orders a good or a product, it can be able to get there, um, you know, you know, in time, electricity, internet connections. I think these are all important support infrastructure if mm -hmm. we are truly going to, you know, to build a resilient digital economy. And I think as something as Erasta said that we also need incentives. So, you know, encouraging um, registrations and protections through intellectual property rights, and maybe even one or two tax incentives here and there for players in the digital, you know, in the digital economy. All right. Well, Alex, you have mentioned a couple of things. You've talked about um, internet connectivity. You've talked about electricity. These are the different challenges. Now, stay with me here. How do innovators deal with challenges of getting a market and make a breakthrough? Sorry, I, just didn't, I didn't get that. How do innovators deal with the challenges of getting a market and make a breakthrough? You know, I, I, I think really that lies on, you know, both the national and county governments because, you know, they're the only ones with the ability to really build 
um, and develop that support infrastructure for developers. Otherwise, developers are left with a very small market and, you know, and to compete within a very small and, and limited market. All right. Well, Joanne, what say you? Oh, um, that's a tricky one. I think that um, I think they should actually form um, uh, lobby groups where they would um, just come together and uh, have uh, um, come together and um, significantly identify the problems that they have okay. and seek to solve these problems together mm -hmm. and uh, of course where they do not have the muscle to solve the problems through infrastructure like alex said um uh seek for avenues to address these uh challenges as a group of innovators all right that would be my what about it all right all right randall getting a market requires advertising okay. so people need to be informed that these products are available Maybe they can, the government can provide an incentive like a tax break to help get the word out there. That's one option. Uh, like jo, uh, like uh, John mentioned, that the lo lobby groups or come up with an association that can address these challenges directly with the government and lobby on behalf of those innovators. Mm -hmm. And let's hear your final take, Erastus. Um, you know, the, uh, the challenges of both the, the challenges are available. So, uh, what I think, uh, since technology normally doubles every 18 months, um, we can bank on innovation, but it's a very fast-changing world. So, uh, what they need is to broaden uh, broaden their customer base, maybe transcend borders, and uh, and make the make the innovation more mainstream, so that they can they they, they, they should not just focus on on a, on a particular market. And also they, they also need the government protection, especially on intellectual property theft. So uh, uh, education on on key areas such as patenting should be made more, much more available for for innovators. All right. Now, um, moving on on to the next uh, topic. According to the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat report, for the first time in decades, yeah, there has been a contraction of GDP of between 2 to 5 percent in sub-Saharan Africa. This is directly attributable to the pandemic, which has sent shockwaves across the sub-Saharan African economies. The COVID-19 crisis has also triggered a reality check. A lot of people have lost jobs in the first and second quarter of this pandemic year, which has exposed the challenges uh, and um, inequalities of business as usual, quote unquote, and money magnified the risks um, inherent in a business model, which often does not have inclusivity and sustainability as priorities. It is now more evident than ever that um, the way we produce, trade, organize our supply chains and consume must change if you want to mitigate short-term impacts and better prepare ourselves for future crises while building the resilience of our economies. Now, Alex, can, uh, <clears throat> can the um, Africa continental free trade area help to future-proof African economies? Um, um, thank you for that question. And I think, you know, of course, yes. Um, I think one of the limitations for most of the innovative companies and budding entrepreneurs in the African continent has been the limited market. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, you know, the emerging economies that have really um, risen above all odds, you know, China, India, most of them really capitalized on their population. So I think the CTA is, you know, is a really good step in terms of doing away with the trading boundaries that we have between countries and it will create a unified you know population or consumer base of uh, i think more than one uh, more than 1 billion people and at least now from that perspective then we are able to compete with china and india in terms of attracting investment in terms of attracting talent and in terms of really attracting um, you know both 
both um, financial investments, technical invest investments, and people investments in the high-tech um, arena. But of course, a lot is going to depend on the different countries into how they implement the FCTA. We had hoped to see that since the operation date was on July 2020, but because of the pandemic, that was postponed to January 2021, which I think is going to be postponed again because you know because of the second wave. But I think it's uh, it's going to future-proof in terms of expanding the. The, the the consumer base but again the key thing is going to be you know there are certain countries where the economies are very developed they have you know better education standards they have better skills um, among its people and some of them might take more advantage of the fcta than, than than the other which is going to probably create a bit of social and political tensions but that still remains with both the au and the different countries all right um Joan? Joanne, can you hear me? Joanne, can you hear me? Uh, okay, I think that um, Would going forward, this is a really, this is a really uh, good move for African countries coming together and just um, working on understanding the different. Um, capacities and uh, development uh, pro uh, progresses. So for me, I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a good move going forward. In terms of uh, future proving the African economies in the future, with a lot of work being done, like Alex has said, between governments and policies being put in place and just supply chains being matched together, uh, it could be a good um, platform for African economies to develop together, mm -hmm. understand each other, and just create um, what we call them value chains and uh, economies uh, that can help uh, push African countries forward. So, uh -huh. looking going forward, it's a good move. All right, Erastus, I'll throw the question to you. Um, right. Can then, the Africa um, continental free uh, trade area future help future proof African economies? Uh, I think um, African uh, African countries have a lot to do in this case because uh, we normally have several several uh, several policies and rules uh, governing different countries. So what we can start with, with is re removing the cross cro cross border tariffs, the, the artificial tariffs are the ones that are limiting. So for example, uh, if we if we are being taxed taxed differently in Kenya and and from and from Uganda, you see that creates a disruption. So I will, I will also agree with Alex because he has mentioned something about India and China banking on their on their populations. And since uh, Africa's population is smaller than even that of India or China, so uh, removing the the artificial tariffs is the way to go. And that will, that way in, in in that way we can we can we can we can insulate our our economies from from future pandemic effects. All right, um, Randall, could you please give us your view? Uh, the good thing about regimes like this is they will also have ways to uh, resolve disputes within different countries, making trade a little bit easier. So it'll, it, it'll create a little bit more efficiency in uh, inter-trade inter within different countries within Africa. All right, and um, uh, just hold on right there. How can the way we produce trade organize our supply chains and consume change if we want to mitigate a short-term impact and better prepare ourselves for future crisis while building the resilience of our economies? Randall? Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you cut off for a second. Uh, I'm saying, how can, um, how can we produce, trade, organize our supply chains and consume change if we want to mitigate short-term impacts and better prepare ourselves for future crises I think that's the best way to while building the resilience of our economies? I think the best way to deal with this is to have some kind of war chest and also some kind of assistance from the African Development Bank so that in times of a pandemic, uh, you have enough, you have, an, you have a place where you can have more money at reasonable rates. 
mm. so that until you get uh, to run your business until you can get back on your feet but now the way the pandemic is running a lot of businesses are running at a loss mm -hmm. or have shut down so if there was a source of income somewhere else maybe a short-term loan with reasonable rates that would be one way that we could future proof uh, our economies all right. Well, uh, Joanne, I'll, I'll throw this one to you as we uh, slowly um, uh, try to wind up. We have one more topic to look at. How can the African private sector recognize and take advantage of business opportunities that will come with an operational free trade area? And how um, even do they get the education and how to go about it? Okay. Sorry, Nina, we didn't hear you. I'm saying, how can the African private sector recognize and take advantage of business um, opportunities that will come with an operational free trade area? And how even do they get the education on how to go about it? Um, we can't hear you, Nina. All right. This seems to be a, a, a technical hitch right there. Can you hear me now? All right, so we seem to be having a, a technical hitch. I think um, uh, we can't reach our guests very well. Well, um, thank you very much for keeping it <coughs> Metropole TV. <laughs> this was Business AM with yours truly, Nina Shabban. Welcome to Randall TV. <laughs> Have a lovely morning.